Let us prepare our hearts with the call to worship. Wearied and overwhelmed we gather, yet God's holy word revives us. Simple yet confused, we yield to the wor God's words. More precious than gold is our Lord. And so we gather with our whole heart to come and worship his holy name. And together we light the Christ candle to remind us of the good news that God is with us. and welcome to Paul Memorial on this beautiful Sunday. We're so glad you could join us for our virtual service. Just a reminder, you can find the words to our hymns on our website. If you'd like to sing along, you will find them there. Another reminder is that on Sunday, March the 21st, we will be having our annual general meeting. If you have not received a copy of the AGM report, or you would like a physical copy, please let me know as soon as possible and I'll be happy to get a copy to you. Now let us come before our God, let us pray. God of creation and God of transformation, we gather our hearts before you this day as we celebrate the good news that not only are you a God who answers prayers, but a God who has promised to always walk with his beloved children. So we stop for a moment to lift up to you our humble prayers. For as the snow starts to melt and we're able to see signs of new life sprouting around us, and this echoes the new life we feel growing within us right now, as each day we're given a chance to grow more into who we were always meant to be. 
We praise you, loving God, for the good news that your Holy Spirit is hard work in our lives and in the world around us. We praise you this morning, Lord, for the gift of Jesus. We confess at times it's hard to find the right words to describe how grateful we are that you gave us your only Son. For Christ came not only to teach us how to live, but that he loves us so much that he was willing to go as far as the cross and the grave for our sake, so that by his wounds we could be made whole. We praise you, mighty God, for the good news that death could not contain the Lord of everlasting life. For we know that Jesus lives, and because he lives, so too shall all those who dare to follow in his ways. At this time, holy God, we now turn our thoughts and prayers to the world, trusting in your promise to always listen to your children praying. Eternal God, we thank and praise you for the good news we received this week of yet another vaccine being given and approved in Canada. We thank you, Lord, that now our seniors are starting to get vaccinated within our community and that soon we'll be able to turn a corner in our fight against COVID-19. We ask that you would continue to bless and watch over those who are leading the fight in this pandemic. We thank you, mighty God, that countries are starting to look after one another as they do donate the supplies to nations in need. Help us, we pray, loving God, to share what we have been given so that one day no one else need fear getting sick. We pray today, Heavenly Father, for those who have been affected by recent changes in the weather. We pray for those in Texas who still do not have clean water to drink, those who are struggling to find food to eat. We pray for those who are dealing with flooding and, and the after effects of another earthquake. Father, help your people, we pray. Keep them safe. Help them find all the support they need for the challenges they face and let them know that they are not alone. Father, we pray for our world. We need your help to keep moving forward, for we're not always sure which path we're called to walk upon. Help us, we pray, to hear the cry of your Holy Spirit. Empower us to once again walk in righteousness for your name's sake. We lift up to you, loving God, those in our life who are ill, those who are waiting for surgery, those who feel lonely and afraid. Send your Holy Spirit to rest upon your people, for we know that we need you in our life. Lastly, God, we pray for ourselves. Grant to us your holy peace, so that we, in turn, might share your peace with those around us. Give to us the strength we need to dare to love as you call us to love, to serve as you taught us to serve, to follow Jesus wherever we may go. All this we pray in Jesus' name, who taught us how to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
It is now time for the children of God's children's story. Now, I have a question for you guys. Have any of you ever gotten mad? You know, you've gotten upset because you want to do something and your parents tell you no. Have any of you maybe thrown a temper tantrum? If you ask my mom, she will tell you that I did that a lot. But do you ever wonder, do you think God gets mad? Do you ever think that God feels the urge to throw himself on the ground and start hitting the floor? It's not often something we think about today, about whether or not God can get angry. Because the sad truth is, God can. But God doesn't get angry because he's told he can't have ice cream for breakfast. And God doesn't get angry because he's told he's got to clean up or put the toys away. Instead, God gets angry when he looks down and sees his people suffering. When he looks down and sees people in power oppressing those who don't have power. God gets angry when he sees people being abused, being hurt, being told that they're not worthy of being loved. And we know this truth because Jesus gets angry. In this morning's scripture reading, we're going to hear the story about Jesus at the temple. And Jesus was angry. The temple was like our church, except it was one for the entire nation. So anyone who wanted to talk to God would go to the temple. Except when you entered the temple, rather than seeing people being close to God and celebrating the good news that God was with them, they were interrupted with stories and people shouting, going, buy this sheep, change your money here. Does that sound like that would be useful to helping you pray? And so Jesus got angry because people were trying to make money off of the relationship that people wanted to have with God. And so he flips over the tables and chases out those who are being bad from the temple. God was angry because people were taught to believe that unless they had enough money to buy special gifts to give to God, that they couldn't talk to the Lord. And that's just one of the times where God was angry. When we read the Bible, we often hear of other stories where God was angry at his people because they didn't follow in his ways. But what's also amazing is every time after God was angry, we're also told that God still loves us, that God still forgives us. As in this week's story, Jesus was angry about what was going on in the temple, but he still loved us enough to go to the cross and to rise again to glory for us. And that's something we need to remember. We're called to go out in our life not to make God angry, but if we do, to know that we can always go back to him and ask for forgiveness and be renewed because God loves us more than he's ever angry with us. God loves us so much that he gave us Jesus so that we could find forgiveness and find new life through him. Thanks be to God. Amen. Good morning. The scripture readings, the first reading will be from 1 Corinthians, verse 1, 13 to 22. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius, so no one can say that you were baptized in my name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't remember if I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom and eloquence, 
lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom. Our second reading is from the New Testament, John 2, verses 13 to 22. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. The disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. May God bless to us this reading of the Holy Word. Let us pray. 
May the words, my mouth, and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, Lord God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. When was the last time you had a good old-fashioned meltdown? Can you remember the last time you saw red and wanted to start throwing things around because it might make you feel better? Truthfully, it's not something we often think about today, as it's considered impolite to do such things in public. It's also considered impolite to admit that it happens in the privacy of our own homes, because we're trained for a young age to believe that behavior like that is wrong. It's excusable in small children as they've yet to find the right words to describe what's going on in their minds. But once they have gained that skill, they're strongly discouraged to vent in such a way. And for most of the time, this is a good thing. Could you imagine if everyone let out their anger and frustration any time they felt like it? Picture going to a grocery store and seeing a grown man throwing himself on the ground in a fit because they dared to run out of his favorite ice cream or a drive through and through and a person's having a meltdown every time they have to wait more than 20 seconds to get their coffee. Or even a person throwing a fit because they didn't like what was being preached on a Sunday morning, because they didn't get to sing their favorite hymn, or because the minister dared to go over the allotted time. All of these things seem rather ridiculous, And it's hard to imagine anyone getting upset about things that happen in any given day. And yet, sometimes it does. I've worked in the customer service industry and I've seen people melt down over the smallest things. I learned to duck when someone is throwing prop tarts at your head because they didn't like the fact that there was a limit to how much they could buy. And some adults today have not learned to hold their temper when things do not go their way. And this might be why I sometimes feel uncomfortable with this morning's gospel reading. As Jesus cleaning out the temple, or as it was called in seminary, the great temple tantrum, I find it strange to think that Christ, the Savior of the world, lost his cool. He starts flipping tables and chasing people away from a temple in rage. This image of a destructive Christ seems to conflict with the other images we have of him, of Jesus, our good shepherd, the wounded savior. In this morning's reading, we're not greeted with Jesus meek and mild, but Jesus full of rage and frustration at what was happening in his father's home. This morning's reading makes us feel uncomfortable, just as it made Jesus' early followers uncomfortable. At the time when it first happened, because it seemed so out of place with the rest of Jesus' message. Or does it? For you see, we today often fall into the same trap as those who have come before us. And that is that we try to force Jesus to fit into our own image, rather than allowing him to transform us into his. And so we often tend to focus only on the image of Jesus that's easy for us to follow and accept. This is often why our pews tend to be filled at Christmas and Easter, as both the baby in the manger and the risen Christ don't ask us to change that much for their sake. As the sermons tend to focus on the celebration of the good news, rather than how we're called to allow this good news to transform us for the sake of the gospel. And while it's wonderful that these people join us for these great events and celebrations, there is more to our story than just the birth and resurrection of our Lord. 
And we, as his followers, are called to dive deeper into his life and his truth than we may be comfortable with. Because our world is not yet how it should be. And that means there's still a lot of work for us to do. Even if this work is not as easy as we might like. So this morning, we're invited to take a closer look at what caused Jesus to lose it in the temple of the Lord and discover anew what the story has to teach us about how we should try to live our life as God's people. For there was a method to Jesus' madness, and if we don't learn from this story, then we're destined to repeat it. We approach this week's story. It's important to keep in mind that this is not the first time that Jesus was in the temple of the Lord. We know that Jesus was there beforehand because the gospel tells us. It was common for people to teach in the temple courtyard as it was there where people who hungered to, more, no, no, to know more about their God gathered. Teaching in the temple ground was as common as hearing a sermon in the church sanctuary. So we need to ask ourselves, what was different this time than all the other times when Jesus stood and taught in the temple? What was it that led him to show his disgust at what was being done in God's house? And the main difference was timing. This great event happens near the end of Jesus' life. He had turned his face towards Jerusalem, towards the cross. He knew that his days were numbered, so he did what he wanted to do from day one. Christ chased out those who were seeking to make a profit on the back of God's people. As the tables that Jesus flipped and the men who Christ chased out of the temple square, they were not there to worship the Lord. They had gathered to make money. These were the merchants who sold animals to be sacrificed in the name of the Lord, those who offered for a high fee to change your money to the proper silver coin that could be given to God. This group of people were clustering up in the courtyard of the temple, a place where anyone could come and worship God. They were businessmen who were seeking to make a profit by overcharging what the people thought they needed to come before God. They would charge triple the price for a gift that wanted to be given to God for thanksgiving or to ask forgiveness and to be brought back into a right relationship with the Lord. Think of it this way. When we get back to worship as usual, how would you feel if on the way to your pew in the church hall you were met with people hawking things that you might need for worship, such as a program for the order of service filled with stats about how many sermons the minister had given, how many were considered good, and how many just missed the mark completely. Or you were told that due to the pandemic, we're no longer accepting normal money. We're now only accepting Australian money. And we're happy to change it for you. But the exchange rate is $2 to the dollar. Or if you wanted your child baptized, you'd have to buy the special baptismal package that includes a gown, photo ops, and ceremonial beer stein. I know this sounds ridiculous, but similar things were happening during Jesus' time. As a paywall was created between God and his people, And the more that Jesus saw this, the more it broke his heart. 
as he saw the people who needed God in their life being turned away or turned off because of the commerce that was happening in God's house. This is a true reason behind Jesus' rage. God's people were being denied the grace and love that God gives freely by those who wanted to put some extra coins into their pocket. This is what caused Jesus to turn violent as he flipped tables and chased people out with a homemade whip. For God's house was turned from a house of prayer into a marketplace where God's grace could be sold for an ever-changing amount. And I'd love to be able to say that after Jesus cleaned the temple, this never happened again. But then I'd be lying. Because I remember the time in church history when we sold indulgences or get-out-of-hell cards for money. We were repeating the same thing that caused Jesus so much pain. And even today, there is a temptation to place money before membership or offer a pay-to-pray pass. Although in today's churches, this practice is called seed ministry. As the, well, I'm not going to call them a minister. As a leader of this, the churches, invite you to plant a seed of a set amount of money. And by planting this seed, usually in small amounts of $1,000, $2,000, $5,000, God will bless you with good fortune, all because you planted that seed. I confess that every time I hear someone from a pulpit mentioning this theology, I cannot help but long to follow Jesus with my own cleaning out of a church or two. But even in our own church life, we need to be watchful to make sure that we don't fall into the same temptation. As we seek to raise funds to support our ministry, because it's easy to justify our actions, it's easy to not always see the heavy burdens that we might be placing on the backs of our brothers and sisters in faith. Because I don't think the market and the temple started out as something to fleece God's people. But over time, this is what it became. And if we're not careful, we could end up doing the very same thing. But this is why we're given this morning's gospel reading, to remind ourselves of what has happened in the past, even if it does make us uncomfortable at the time. It's given to us to help us to remember to take steps so that we don't need to fear Jesus showing up in our house of worship, tipping over tables and chasing us out of God's house. Because as followers of Christ, we're called to change the world with our actions, not to have the world change us. We're called to remember the good news that Jesus lost his temper for our sake, to remember that God can use even our anger, our righteous indignation, to help make the world a better place for God's people. So perhaps, just maybe, we're too quick to put away our anger at how the world is. For with God's help, we're able to channel it. Channel it into something that can make the world a better place for all of us. As with God's help, anger can be transformed into advocacy for those who need it the most. And this is what God's mission is all about. Transforming the parts of our lives that we long to hide into something that can be used to help those around us. 
And we're able to do all of this because Christ did it for us first. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for all the amazing gifts you've given to us. And so in response, we offer up to you our tithes and our offerings. May they multiply and serve your needs as we prepare for your coming kingdom of heaven. Thanks be to God. Amen. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, now and forevermore. Amen.